chapter eighteen of more about pixie by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain at the circus mamzelle patty began and continued her work in the wallace nursery with complete satisfaction to all concerned esmeralda it is true had surpassed herself in violence of diction in the letter which came in answer to the one breaking the news but while bridgie shed tears of distress and jack frowned impatience the person against whom the hurricane of invective was hurled received it with unruffled and even sympathetic composure as pixie read over the crowded sheets her eye flashed approval of dramatic points she set her lips and wagged her head entering so thoroughly into the spirit of the writer that she unconsciously adopted her manner when aroused and when the concluding words were read heaved a deep sigh of satisfaction she'll feel a lot better after that she remarked tersely and the prophecy could not fail to be comforting to those who knew mrs hilliard's temperament after such an outburst repentance might be expected to set in even more speedily than usual and a peace-offering in the shape of a hamper crowded with good things could be confidently looked for in the course of the next few days esmeralda disliked formal apologies and from the boy's point of view at least turkeys and game made a more eloquent amend viva and inda wallace were loving and lovable children but possessed with a nervous restlessness an insatiable curiosity and with such easily roused tempers as would have reduced an ordinary adult governess to despair within a very short period their delicate mother was occupied with many social duties and the father though devoted to his pretty daughters had little patience with their vagaries while the frequent screaming attacks which sounded through the house had a trying effect on nerves already strained by long residence abroad parents and servants alike breathed sighs of relief when each morning punctually as the clock struck ten mamzelle patty came running upstairs primed with half a dozen thrilling devices for amusement and occupation viva as ringleader and rebel-in-chief had flatly refused to speak or listen to a word of french but when it was presently revealed to her that the spookjacks understood no other language there was no course left but to withdraw her opposition the bobbity shooties were english and stupid at that but by the time that nicholas spookjack had succeeded in teaching them how to address him with propriety the two unsuspicious listeners to the conversation had themselves mastered the lesson without once suspecting what they were about the adventures which those two enterprising and admirable families went through were as varied as they were endless and each day brought a thrilling development of the situation nicholas spookjack thought nothing of going out in a diving bell in the morning and a balloon in the afternoon while the bobbity shooties entertained royalty to dinner in the kitchen cupboard and feasted luxuriously on the cruets and the pinked-out paper which covered the shelves she don't teach us nothin we only plays was little inda's summing up of the situation but a moment later she would repeat a dialogue which had taken place between the rival factions during the morning reproducing with the wonderful imitative faculty of children the very accent and gesture with which it had been delivered and her parents would look at each other with delighted appreciation mamzelle patty was a grand institution and being generously disposed people mr and mrs wallace endeavoured to show their gratitude by including her in the many amusements which were arranged for the children's benefit she accompanied them on sight-seeing expeditions organized games at evening parties and on one memorable occasion paid a visit to the circus pixie had always cherished a passion for clowns and when in paris had appreciated nothing more than an evening at the nouveau cirque 
where auguste the frenchman played a secondary part to his english brother and the performance concluded with a play in which the british tourist played a large part conspicuous in plaid suits sailor hats and thick-soled shoes she was all eagerness to see the london circus and nearly as much excited as her pupils as they drove up to the door and took their seats on the red velvet chairs inda sat by her mother and stared solemnly around but viva insisted upon being next her dear mamzelle and pranced up and down in a manner which augured ill for future comfort once she began to fidget adieu to all hope of peace for her companions once she began to ask questions it was safe to predict that she would go on until despair seized those who were obliged to answer pixie recognized signs of the coming attack and managed an adroit change of places which would leave mrs wallace free to enjoy the afternoon and punctually at three o'clock the performance began the ringmaster walked in and cracked his whip the clown tumbled head over heels into the arena and cried here we are again the lady rider jumped through paper hoops and blew kisses to the audience viva's cheeks grew a vivid pink and at each change in the performance she adopted a change of position when the hook of her jacket had been extricated from the hair of the lady in front she perched herself on the arm of her own chair when she had applauded herself backward into pixie's arms she leant against the supercilious-looking gentleman in the next seat and tickled his cheeks with her fluffy hair then the first wonder wore away and she found her tongue why does the clown look like that it's a way they have in the family they always have those funny eyes and red and white faces did he always look like that he did all the time he has been a clown is it the same clown that was here before it says on the paper it's a new one for the occasion then why does he say he is here again i'll ask him next time we meet hush now and listen to what he is saying see how they are all laughing does the clown sleep in the circus deed he does not poor creature there are no beds and the seats are too hard where does he sleep then what is his true home number seven poplar gardens corner of fillmore park the corner house with the red curtains pixie understood her pupil's love of detail by this time and viva put her head on one side and stared at her with gratified admiration if she had asked her mother she would have looked tired and sighed my dear child how should i know don't ask ridiculous questions but mamzelle patty knew better than that her face assumed an expression of radiant satisfaction as she pondered on that house in poplar gardens big and grey with flower boxes in the windows and little clowns looking out of the nursery windows delightful she was silent for several minutes and the supercilious gentleman took advantage of the pause to examine the party with curious eyes the elegant-looking woman was plainly the mother of the little girls, but who was this, who was scarcely more than a child herself, who was addressed as Mamselle and spoke with a strong Irish accent? He stared at her, and Viva, discovering his glance, turned round with her back to the ring and stared back with leisurely enjoyment. At first her face expressed nothing but curiosity but gradually her features became twisted the lips drawn down the eyebrows elevated to an unnatural height until the beholder realized with horror that she was experimenting on his own expression and endeavouring to copy it on her own small visage many a long year had passed since he had known what it meant to blush but he blushed then and hitched round in his seat to hide his scarlet face from view while viva once more turned her attention to the ring the white-skirted lady had disappeared and another was cantering round clad in a riding habit and gentleman's hat the horse was black and shone like satin he pawed the ground with dainty cat-like tread the ringmaster followed him as he went and cracked his whip 
in encouraging fashion viva planted one foot on pixie's toe and jumped up and down to attract attention is the gentleman really angry that he cracks his whip does he pretend to be angry if he pretends to be angry why do all the others pretend that they think he doesn't pretend but only why does the gentleman crack his whip maybe he hears you talking i saw him cast his eye upon you replied pixie sagely and the supercilious gentleman pointed the sentence with a sigh and privately resolved to remove his seat at the first opportunity the threat of the whip however had the effect of quietening miss viva for a good two minutes and in the meantime fate sent an unexpected deliverance certain portions of the auditorium were portioned off into squares which did duty for private boxes and into the nearest of these there now entered a party of ladies and children in whom he recognized some intimate friends to advance towards them and beg the use of a vacant chair was the work of a moment when he proceeded to pour the story of his woes into the ear of the young lady by his side she was fair and pretty charmingly dressed and almost as supercilious in expression as he was himself little wretch how impossible of her she ejaculated and bent forward to examine the wretch forthwith viva had climbed on the empty seat and was craning her little face to right and left to discover where the deserter had fled with her great blue eyes and rose-leaf complexion set in a frame of golden hair she looked like an angel from heaven or one of the sweet-faced cherubs who float in space at the top of christmas cards and valentines but it was not on viva that the young lady's attention was riveted but upon the figure by her side mamzelle patty in all the glory of a french hat wearing the very biggest hair ribbon in her possession in honour of the occasion at the sight of the profile the young lady started and cried it is it must be then she dodged backwards saw the hat and became filled with doubt no it can't it's much too smart finally pixie turned round to apostrophize miss viva who was in the act of striding the back of her chair and immediately a flash of recognition leapt from eye to eye the french hat nodded until the feathers fairly quivered with the strain and the face beneath became a beam of delight in which her eyes disappeared and the parted lips stretched back to a surprising distance the fair-haired young lady had more respect to appearance in her recognition but all the same she grew quite pink with pleasure and cried eagerly it's my dearest friend we were at school together but she has been in paris finishing her education and i have not heard from her since her return i must speak to her in the interval i really must you can't think what a fascinating little creature she is when you get to know her oh really she looks distinctly uh, out of the common drawled the supercilious man lazily rather interesting-looking woman the children's mother some relation of your friend i suppose oh i suppose so the o'shaughnessys are a very good family very well connected beautiful old place in ireland drawled the young lady in her turn and in the intervals of the performance she proceeded to expatiate on the grandeur of the o'shaughnessy family the beauty of esmeralda and the riches of her husband until her companion looked forward with increased interest to the coming introduction at the first interval pixie came forward in response to eager beckonings and stood leaning against the side of the box talking to her friend with superb disregard of the more extended audience fancy now the two of us meeting without knowing that we were here you look quite old lottie with your hair done up turn your head and let me see the back do you still curl it with slate pencils like you did at school i came home at christmas and i've thought of writing ever since but i've been too busy 
i suppose you're busy too now you are grown up and living at home have you come out gone to dances in low necks we had an old servant at knock and one day a friend came to lunch and she says to bridgie that's a fine handsome young lady she is says bridgie she's just come out out of where says molly staring pixie darted a quick glance round the box to enjoy the general appreciation of her joke then gave a low chuckle of satisfaction you'll never guess what i'm doing no said lottie vane complacently she too had noticed the smiles of the audience and was anxious to encourage her friend in her reminiscences in society people were always grateful for being amused and if in her recital pixie let fall further references to the standing and importance of her family why so much the better for all concerned what mischief are you up to now you funny little thing i'm in service said pixie proudly the shocked amaze of lottie's expression the involuntary rustle of surprise which went round the box were as so many tributes to the thrilling nature of the intelligence and she waited a moment to enjoy it before pointing unabashed in the direction of the two children and condescending to further explanations me pupils i've been with them now for over a month what do you mean how absurd you are pixie cried lottie irritably in service you i never heard such nonsense as if you were a servant i don't know what you're talking about i get wages anyhow and that's all i care about they are my pupils i tell you and i've brought them here with their mother for a little diversion i've the training of them every morning for a couple of hours and thirty pounds a year paid every month jack and i make enough between us to support the family you don't really mean it gasped lottie horrified her cheeks were scarlet and it was evident that she was profoundly uncomfortable but as she met the triumphant eyes her face softened and she made a valiant effort to retain composure you mean to say you have turned into a governess at sixteen you who were always at the bottom of the class and couldn't get a sum right to save your life poor little girls i pity their education how did you ever persuade the mother to take you mamzelle patty tossed her head with complacent pride deed me dear the room was packed with them and natives at that and she chose me before the whole bunch i'm not supposed to teach them anything but french and i don't teach that except by playing games but i keep them from crying and quarrelling and you don't need to be head of your class for that twasn't cleverness she took me for as she told me plainly the first day i went twas me influence a smothered laugh went round the box at the sound of this curious compound word uttered in tones of complacent pride but lottie vane did not laugh and her hand stretched out involuntarily and clasped the little fingers which lay on the side of the box her face lost its supercilious expression and grew sweet and womanly dear little pixie she said softly i don't pity the pupils after all i think they are very well off may i come over and be introduced to them and their mother she must be a very wise woman the two girls walked forward towards the spot where mrs wallace was sitting and the supercilious man looked after them with thoughtful eyes he had always admired miss lottie vane though he had privately sneered at her snobbish tendencies but it occurred to him to-day that he had been over hasty in judgment how sweet she had looked as she answered her little friend how kindly had been the tones of her voice he felt his heart thrill with the beginning of a new and deeper interest End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of more about pixie by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain a tea party 
jack kept his resolve of avoiding dangerous tete-a-tetes with sylvia trevor and kept it in so pleasant and friendly a manner that no one suspected his motives save the person most concerned she knew only too well that a wall of division had suddenly risen between them but though her heart ached she carried her proud little head more erect than ever and was so very very lively and pleasant that jack in his turn was deceived and believed that she was relieved by his absence when they met as meet they did from time to time they laughed and joked and teased each other about little family jokes and bridgie listened delightedly and told herself that it did jack all the good in the world to meet sylvia for he was growing so much quieter and seemed so worried over that horrid old business miss munns however had the same complaint to make about her niece and delivered herself of many homilies on the subject extremes she said extremes my dear ought always to be avoided to be constantly running from one extreme to another shows an unbalanced character a medium path is the wisest which one can choose and one should show neither undue elation nor foundless depression at the events of life i remember a proverb which we used to quote as children laugh in the morning cry before night and there is a great deal of truth in it too high spirits are bound to be brought low before very long well i think it's a horrid proverb and a very wicked one into the bargain cried sylvia hotly it sounds as if god disliked seeing one happy and i believe he loves it and means it and tries to teach us that it is a duty he made the world as bright as he could for us to live in with the sunshine and the flowers and he made all the little animals skip and bound and play games among themselves so it stands to reason that he expects men and women to be happy too especially young ones exactly precisely just what i say i was just pointing out to you my love that it is over an hour since you made a remark and that such depression of spirits was very trying to me as your companion cried miss munn with an air of triumph after the long period of anxiety through which i have passed i think i am entitled to expect some cheering society but then you see i might cry before evening retorted sylvia pertly and had the satisfaction of feeling that she had been rude to her elders and put herself helplessly in the wrong as miss munns took up her stocking bag and began to darn drooping her eyelids with an air of stony displeasure sylvia glanced at her from time to time during the next half hour and felt ashamed of herself and wished she were sweet-tempered like bridgie and thought how nice it would be if she could learn to think before she spoke and be cautious and prudent and never say what she was sorry for afterwards she also wished that aunt margaret would not look so particularly old and frail this morning of all others how thin she was what great big hollows she had in her cheeks it was rather dreadful to be old like that and have no one to love and care for one best of all no one but a thoughtless girl who was never so grateful as she ought to be and sometimes even really impertinent the wave of penitence could not be repressed and she jumped from her seat with her characteristic impetuosity and threw her arms round her aunt's shoulders i'm sorry i answered you back auntie it was horrid of me i've been a great trouble to you this winter but i really am awfully grateful for all your goodness do give me a kiss and say you forgive me well 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 my dear child don't be so impetuous you have nearly pulled the cap off my head extremes as i said before always extremes 
do please try to exercise some self-control i quite understand that you are troubled about your foot but as the doctor says it is only a question of time and if you are patient for a month or two more you will be able to go about as well as ever there is no necessity to brood about it as you do no necessity at all sylvia was not brooding about her foot but she did not choose to say so to miss munns and her silence being accepted as a sign of submission the old lady became so mollified as to suggest that the two miss o'shaughnessys should be invited to tea forthwith afternoon tea under miss munns regime was a more formal meal than is usually the case and also a trifle more solid for it was followed by no dinner but a supper of cocoa and potted meat served at nine o'clock this arrangement was one of sylvia's minor trials in life but pixie o'shaughnessy saw great compensations in a tea where you really sat up to the table and had jam in a pot and a loaf and scones and eggs it fascinated her to see how the table was laid with a white cloth spread diamond-wise under the tea-tray and the different viands dotted about on the green baize miss munns boiled her own water and ladled the tea out of a little silver caddy and dipped the bottom of each cup in water before it was filled to prevent slippings on the saucer she had a kettle holder worked in cross-stitch red wool roses on a black wool background and a cosy ornamented with a wreath of bead flowers the eggs were boiled to order hard or soft just as you liked in a silver pot filled with mentholated spirits out of a fascinating thimble-like measure pixie watched the various preparations with rapt attention while the two elder girls chatted together at the end of the table i want you to give me whitey's address bridgie said so that i can send her some flowers esmeralda sent me a hamper this morning so i am rather rich and would like to share my good things you said she was nursing a case in the city so she probably has no flowers and it's cheery to have boxes coming in as a surprise it's so hard for nurses to live in a constant atmosphere of depression and sickness when one is ill for a long time as you were one gets so bored and wearied by the monotony of the sick-room and it's such bliss to be free again and speak at the pitch of your voice and be done with medicines and pulses and temperatures and tiresome rules and regulations but the nurse never gets free just when things are beginning to get cheerful she goes away to another darkened room and another anxious household and the whole program begins over again they love their work of course but it must be very hard sometimes don't you think so i i sylvia pursed up her lips and elevated her eyebrows in deprecatory fashion i never thought of it it does sound hard when you put it like that but i'm afraid i just took it for granted that it was their work whitey never grumbled she left that to me and was always cheerful though i found out afterwards that she had been awfully anxious about her sister i wish i had thought of sending her flowers send these do cried bridgie eagerly she will like them better from you and i don't mind a bit so long as she gets them i'll send over the box and you shall address it and put in a little note yes you must because i felt rather mean about not bringing some for yourself but there were not very many and as i was going into town i couldn't resist taking some to the woman in the waiting-room the woman in the-what do you mean bridgie laughed easily <laughs> at london of course there are several waiting-rooms at our station but i go to the dullest of all where there is hardly a gleam of light and one day i saw the woman staring so longingly at some flowers which a lady was carrying since then i have generally taken her a little bunch when i go up to town and it is quite pathetic the way she grabs them she knows me now and looks so pleased to see me 
that was an easy thing to imagine sylvia pictured to herself the long monotonous day in that dreary little room the constant hope which reached its fulfilment when the door swung open and bridgie's face smiled a greeting leaving behind her the fragrant blossoms to sweeten the hours with their own perfume and the remembrance of another's care such a simple thing to do such an easy thing why had she never thought of it herself she would have done it gladly enough if it had occurred to her mind it was not heart that was wanted but thought oh what a number of lives might be brightened what an army of good deeds would be accomplished if people would only think well my dear i only hope she was a decent woman and worthy of your kindness said miss munns primly a lazy life i call it i've no opinion of people who make their living by sitting still all day i had occasion to wait at a station some little time ago and entered into conversation with the woman in charge she said she was a widow and i advised her to use my furniture polish for the woodwork was in a disgraceful condition and she answered me back in a most unbecoming manner i have done a great deal of charitable work in my day and am on three committees at the present moment so i am not easily taken in i have been investigating cases for relief this very afternoon and if you'll believe me in one house where they asked for help there was a musical box upon the table the woman said it was given to her by an old mistress and that it amused the children while she did her work i told her we did not undertake to relieve cases who could afford to keep musical instruments i don't know what the poor are coming to these days she must dispose of it before i can have anything to do with her but twas a present to her it's not polite to give away presents who do you want her to give it to queried pixie with the wide-eyed stare which always made miss munns feel so hot and discomposed she frowned and fidgeted with the kettle while pixie continued to discuss the situation i know what it is to have children about when there's something to do mrs wallace gave me a book the other day and the schemes i made to get time to look at the pictures i was supposed to have gone out for a walk and they were to prepare a surprise for me when i got back and twas a surprise they'd pretended to be savages and pulled all the feathers out of my hat to stick in their hair very ill-mannered and impertinent i call it i hope you gave them a good scolding i did not said pixie calmly i don't like scolding meself and it makes me worse i merely remarked that it was a pity as i'd have to sew them back again instead of playing games twas dull work watching me sew and i didn't disturb myself with hurrying ye couldn't bribe them within yards of me hat this last week mm. when i was a child i was whipped when i did wrong and that was the end of it but things have changed since then and time will prove which was the best system another cup of tea miss bridgie i hope you have good news of your sister and the little boy yes thank you miss munns they are both well and we are hoping to see them quite soon they come up to their town house at the beginning of may and we expect to have quite a gay time esmeralda is bringing a house-party of old irish friends with her and it will be delightful to meet again she always loved entertaining and was clever in devising novelties and now that she has plenty of money she can do as she likes without thinking of the cost you must get your fineries ready sylvia there will be lots of invitations for you next month sylvia's smile was less whole-hearted than it would have been if one sentence had been omitted from bridgie's announcement old friends from ireland would of a surety include miss molly burrell and esmeralda would see that jack made the most of his opportunity it would not be exactly pleasure to accept invitations for the sake of seeing other people flirting together while she herself sat alone in the corner 
i shan't go she told herself if she asks me i shall refuse i don't care to be patronised at park lane or anywhere else i'd rather stay at home and play cribbage in rutland road but all the same in the depths of her heart she knew well that when the time came she would not have enough resolution to say no the temptation to obtain a glimpse of the fashionable world of which she had read so much and seen too little would be too great to be resisted she would go even if it were to have her heart stabbed with a fresh pain and to come home to weep herself to sleep my dear your sister will have plenty of friends to ask without thinking of sylvia she won't find it plain sailing looking after a big house like that i should advise her to engage a housekeeper if she doesn't want to be cheated right and left i know what servants are when the mistress is never in the kitchen to look after the scraps i dare say i might be able to help her to find a suitable woman in connection with our different agencies i'll inquire for you if you think she would like it dear miss munns how kind of you i'll write to esmeralda at once and i dare say she would be most grateful you make me quite ashamed of myself when i think of all the work you do and how lazy and useless i am in comparison cried bridgie earnestly her grey eyes were fixed on miss munns's face with the sweetest most unaffected admiration and sylvia looked at them both and thought many thoughts miss munns did indeed give both time and strength to charitable work and withal a generous share of her small income but her interest was of the head not of the heart and she was sublimely ignorant of her failure to help or comfort bridgie thought she was not helping at all and was ashamed of herself because she was on no committees and knew nothing of authorised agencies her ignorance was so sweet that it would be a sin to enlighten it but there was something in sylvia's expression which aroused her friend's curiosity what are you thinking of sylvia she asked something nice very nice said sylvia smiling she had just recalled a quotation which seemed as though it might have been written to describe bridgie o'shaughnessy sweet souls without reproach or blot who do god's will and know it not end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of more about pixie by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain a luncheon basket esmeralda announced her arrival in town on the first of may a week in advance of her house party so that she might have leisure to visit her brothers and sisters and put the final touches to her own preparations she did not mention the hour of her arrival but this was easily calculated and at home in rutland road bridgie and pixie held eager committee meetings as to the best method of welcome it was decided not to go to the station as esmeralda did not appreciate being taken unawares and would of a certainty be annoyed if her son and heir were beheld at a disadvantage babies are bound to be cross at the end of a journey and his little frock would be soiled and crumpled and she will want him to look his very very best no we will go straight to park lane bridgie decided and arrive an hour after they are due so that they will have time to get tidy the house will be upset of course for it has been closed for so long and we may be able to help i shall never forget the day we came here all the furniture piled in the middle of the rooms and nowhere to sit down and nothing to eat and my poor back aching as if it were broken that's another thing i was thinking about we'll take lunch with us already prepared a cold chicken i think and some fruit for dessert and enjoy it together we three girls if we have to sit on the floor to eat it how lovely it will be to meet again it seems too good to be true p 
pixie was delighted at the idea of the luncheon basket and when the eventful day arrived one little extra after another was added to the original list until the weight became quite formidable but bridgie declared that an omnibus ran to within but a short distance of their destination and the two girls set off in high spirits each holding a handle of the basket and swinging it gaily to and fro curious glances were cast towards it en route whereat pixie beamed with pride it looked so like a picnic basket with the top bulging from the sides allowing glimpses to be seen of the fruit bags and the white linen serviette enfolding the chicken she was convinced that the beholders were consumed with envy and curiosity arrived at park lane pixie was much concerned to realize that esmeralda's much vaunted town residence was situated in this dull and narrow street in vain bridgie represented that the site was famous the world over the little sister smiled quietly and retained her own opinion bridgie as usual was making the best of the situation but it was evident that geoffrey's riches had been much exaggerated since this was the best he could do for his wife poor esmeralda how disappointed she would be what a good thing it was that they had brought the cold chicken to take off the first edge of disappointment the house itself looked dark and gloomy but there were a great many windows and looking upwards pixie espied a glimpse of a graceful head inside the line of one of the curtains the travellers had indeed arrived and in another moment the three sisters would be reunited after four months separation ring again darling i can't this basket weighs me down said bridgie straining at the heavy handle and then came surprise number one for even as she spoke the door was flung back and there appeared on the threshold one immaculate-looking manservant while farther down the hall stood two more in attitudes of attention three whole men to open one door this was indeed a height of luxury to which the simple irish mind had never soared and where was the upset and confusion which had been expected where the signs of recent arrival where the smallest most trifling evidence of confusion the stately hall looked as if it had been undisturbed from immemorial ages and the butler stared at the two girls and their basket with lofty disdain not at home madam bridgie gasped and looked blank dismay but pixie's shrill protest could not be restrained not at home when i saw her meself not a second ago looking out of the window what would have happened it is difficult to say but at that moment a voice sounded from afar repeating two names over and over again in tones of rapturous welcome the man stepped aside and bridgie pressed the basket into his hands and raced along the hall past the staring footman to the bend of the stairs where esmeralda stood with arms stretched wide pixie was only a step aside and esmeralda escorted the two girls upstairs to her own room talking breathlessly the while of course he said i was not at home we arrived only an hour ago so i can hardly be ready for visitors yet but i saw the top of your hats from the nursery windows you must come this very minute and see the boy he is sweeter than ever every one says he is a perfect beauty oh me dears how glad i am to see you how sweet of you to come of course we came we thought perhaps we might be able to help bridgie said looking around the gorgeous staircase with pensive regret we imagined you in such an upset dear with the carpets up and the furniture covered with dust sheets and we thought we could dust and put things straight as we used to do at knock you told us you were coming to open the house you didn't expect i was going to work myself drawled esmeralda her impetuous manner changing suddenly to one of drawling affectation 
the servants have been here for a week getting ready for our arrival i have nothing to look after but a few frocks and preparation for the fray next week did you expect to see me in an apron with a duster over my head it makes no difference to me what you wear said bridgie quietly and at that esmeralda laughed and became herself once more it does to me though the best of everything is good enough for me nothing less you dear old thing it's like old times to have you looking at me with that solemn face no one keeps me in order now jeff tries occasionally but it's such an evident effort that it doesn't have much effect it will be quite good for me to have some family snubbings once more this is the way to the nursery this door now my beauty come to mother she's brought two new aunties to see you the beauty regarded his relations in stolid silence for a moment then hung his lower lip and began to howl his mother walked him up and down the room striving by various blandishments to win him back to smiles but he kept turning his head over his shoulder to gaze at his new relatives with an expression of agonized incredulity as though loath to believe that such monsters could really exist on the earth he was very fat and very bald and if truth were told not a beauty at all but esmeralda made a fascinating mother and was so happily deluded about his charms that it would have been cruel to undeceive her even pixie managed for once to preserve a discreet silence while bridgie's ejaculations of astonishment at size and weight passed muster as admiration with the complacent mother and nurse you shall see him again later on esmeralda announced as though anxious to soften the pain of separation as she led her sisters from the room i must show you over the house before lunch geoffrey had the drawing-rooms redecorated before we were married but this is the first time i have been able to entertain i wish you would come and stay here bridgie but i suppose nothing would make you desert the boys never mind you will be here every time that there is anything going on and it is not much fun preparing when one has a houseful of servants do you remember how we used to be making jellies and creams all the day before and running about arranging the house until a few minutes before the time when the people arrived that's all over now and i do nothing but give orders and grumble this way there what do you think of that for an imposing vista it was indeed very imposing for one long yellow room opened into another decorated in palest blue which in its turn showed a glimpse of a conservatory gay with flowers the rooms were so huge so lofty in stature that pixie was puzzled to understand how the unimposing exterior could contain such surprises while esmeralda strutted about displaying one treasure after another giving detailed descriptions of exactly how the rooms were to be arranged for the contemplated entertainments and gazing complacently at her own reflection in the long mirrors she looked ridiculously young to be the mistress of this fine establishment and despite occasional affectations there is more of the schoolgirl than of the woman of the world in her happy voice and eager gestures from the reception rooms the sisters adjourned to the dining room a big somewhat gloomy apartment facing the street very handsome very severe and evidently dedicated to one purpose only and never by any chance entered from the time one meal ended until another began the butler was arranging dishes on the sideboard the table was spread with a glittering profusion of glass and silver and an array of cold dainties at sight of which bridgie blushed and stared at the floor she waited trembling to hear pixie's exclamation but none came and as they adjourned towards the library she slipped her hand through esmeralda's arm and said half laughing half nervous i don't understand the ways of grand ladies yet joan dear i shall have to get into them by degrees 
you wrote that you were coming to open the house and i imagined you were in the same sort of confusion which we were in at rutland road only of course ten times worse as your house is so big we thought you would be tired and hungry and perhaps have nothing to eat but sandwiches or biscuits and we we brought some lunch for you and ourselves esmeralda threw back her head and laughed with much enjoyment <laughs> you funny dear i never heard of anything so quaint it was sweet of you all the same and i'm ever so grateful but oh dear what would the servants say if they knew they would think my relations had come out of the ark and where in the world have you put the provisions i bridgie looked round for pixie but she had lingered behind and there was no one to help her out of her plight i had the basket in my hand and we were standing at the door and i heard you calling and i rushed in i gave it to some one i was in such a hurry i hardly noticed who it was i think it was the man in the dining-room now montgomery echoed esmeralda blankly she stood staring at bridgie with horrified eyes bridgie how could you what do you mean by it what did you bring and how was it made up chicken and pies and apples and a tin of toffee everything you liked and some little rolls and a pot of butter they were in a basket a big basket with a serviette over the top cried bridgie with desperate candour determined to tell the worst at once and get it over at home at rutland road it had seemed such a simple and natural thing to do but ten minutes experience of park lane had shown clearly enough how unnecessary had been her anxiety how ridiculous it must seem in the estimation of the household she looked at esmeralda with troubled eyes and esmeralda flushed and cried testily a basket of provisions and you handed it to montgomery he would think of course that it was his duty to open it and oh bridgie how could you he will tell the story in the servants hall and they will all laugh and make fun it's it's too tiresome i can't think how you can have made such a mistake i thought of you you see and not of the servants it never occurred to my mind that you could be ashamed of me whatever i did said bridgie quietly i'm not in the least ashamed of you i'm ashamed of the basket you ask jack when you go home and he'll tell you twas a foolish thing to do and you walking too and not driving to the door we won't talk about it any more or we shall both get angry and it's done now and can't be helped what do you think of this room Geoffrey's quite proud of his books and we mean to make this our private little den and retire here when we are tired of living in public here's the electric light you see switched on to these movable lamps so that one can read comfortably in any position very nice so convenient it looks most comfortable bridgie's voice sounded formal and ill at ease and both sisters felt the position a trifle strained and were unaffectedly relieved to see pixie strolling toward them at this critical minute she was smiling to herself as at a pleasant remembrance and lost no time in entering into conversation i don't know how it is about butlers they all love me she announced thoughtfully the wallace one turns his back to the sideboard when i talk and the vegetable dishes wobble when he hands them round he tries hard not to laugh because it's rude for servants to see a joke but he really appreciates them frightfully much your one has whiskers too and isn't he pleasant to talk to not half as proud as he looks we have just been talking about the basket because he'd got chickens already and he asked what he should do with ours i said we'd take it back of course because it would be a treat to us to-night that was quite right wasn't it bridgie yes darling perfectly right said bridgie esmeralda frowned bit her lip and finally succumbed even as the butler had done before her and laughed with a good grace she hugged pixie and pixie hugged her back and chattered away so freely and naturally that it was impossible for restraint to live in her presence 
esmeralda as usual avoided a formal apology but when geoffrey arrived and the little party were seated round the luncheon-table she made the amende honorable by telling him of the basket incident in the presence of three men-servants with as much unction as if it had given her the most unmitigated delight thank you bridgie you are a brick how jolly of you to have taken so much trouble if i'd known of that chicken before i began lunch nothing would have induced me to eat anything else cried geoffrey heartily there was no snobbishness about him at any rate and to judge from the glance which his wife cast upon him it was evident that she was quite able to appreciate a quality that was lacking in her own composition they seemed very happy together this young husband and wife and as bridgie saw them smile at one another across the table for no other reason than pure happiness and content in each other's presence when esmeralda announced geoffrey says as the definite conclusion of any argument and geoffrey said quietly esmeralda likes it as though the fact debarred all further discussion when she heard and saw all this the pain which was so bravely buried in bridgie's heart seemed to take a fresh lease of life and stab her with the memory of dead hopes it was not that she envied esmeralda her happiness bridgie had none of the dog in the manger in her composition but she felt suddenly oppressed by loneliness and a sense of want which the quiet home life failed to satisfy once she had imagined that this happiness would be hers in the future but that hope was dead and it did not seem possible that it could ever come to life again even if by chance she met dick victor in the future what explanation could he have to offer which would wipe away the reproach of that long silence bridgie hoped they might never meet it would be too painful to see her idol dethroned from his pedestal are they worth a penny dear i've asked you the same question twice over cried esmeralda mischievously and bridgie came back to the present with a shock of remembrance i was wool gathering again so sorry what did you want to know i was talking about our invitations do you want any cards for friends is there any one whom you would like me to ask lottie vane please and mr and mrs wallace cried pixie eagerly and esmeralda smiled at the first name and frowned at the second she remembered having seen the vanes at a school festival and being favourably impressed by their appearance but the name of wallace was still repugnant to her ears and could not be heard unmoved she did not care however to appear ungracious in geoffrey's presence and reflected that it might be judicious to impress pixie's employers with the grandeur of the o'shaughnessy family and thus nip in the bud any ideas of patronage a moment later she was thankful that she had made no objections as sylvia trevor's name from bridgie's lips convinced her that here at least a stand must be made oh my dear it is no use asking miss trevor she is lame and i shall have enough to do without looking after invalids she would come with us and we would take care of her the boys are so fond of sylvia they think it a pleasure pleaded innocent bridgie all unconscious of the fatal nature of her argument and esmeralda frowned again and said impatiently she'd much better stay at home crowded rooms are no place for people who need such care no but that is all the more reason why she should get what enjoyment she can she would love one of the receptions you spoke of when you will have music and other entertainments and her limp can scarcely be noticed now she would be no trouble to you you asked her to visit you in ireland esmeralda deed i did and she snubbed me for my pains i don't like miss trevor and i don't mean to give her the chance of refusing any more invitations bridgie looked aghast as well she might and made no attempt to hide her discomfiture but i told her you would i made quite sure of it and told her she would have such a good time the poor girl is counting upon it 
and she is bridgie's friend bridgie wants to bring her that settles the question surely said geoffrey quietly he looked across the table with uplifted brows and wonder of wonders esmeralda blushed and murmured vaguely about being much pleased what a mercy it was that geoffrey was at home but oh if you love me pixie never never let sylvia guess that we had to plead for her invitations pleaded bridgie earnestly as the two sisters made their way home an hour later on end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of more about pixie by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain an at home fortunately or unfortunately as the case may be there is no hallmark of sincerity to distinguish one invitation from another and the printed cards which were in due time received by sylvia trevor differed in no respect from those sent to the most favoured of esmeralda's guests fortunately also the remarks with which invitations are received are not overheard by the prospective hostess else might she often feel her trouble wasted and repent when it was too late mrs hilliard's fashionable acquaintances yawned when they received her cards and exclaimed another engagement for thursday we shall have to accept i suppose but it's a dreadful nuisance we can just look in for a quarter of an hour on our way to lady joan's dance and unfashionable sylvia pursed up her lips and remarked to herself hm, i suppose she wants to dazzle me with the sight of her splendours much pleasure my company will give her i shall go of course i don't think i could stay quietly at home and play cribbage and know that bridgie and the boys were driving away and that i might have been with them yes i'll go and i will get a new dress for the occasion a beauty dad said i might be extravagant once in a way without emptying the exchequer and he would like me to look nice perhaps bridgie will go to town with me and help me to choose it is nice to have some excitement to look forward to what with typhoid and jack this has been the dullest winter i ever knew the advent of the hilliards did indeed make a great difference to the two quiet households in rutland road esmeralda was too much occupied with her guests to pay many visits in person but she appeared at intervals leaning back against the cushions of the carriage and looking like some wonderful princess out of a fairy tale and as far removed as possible from the good ladies of the neighbourhood the coachman would draw up before the door of number three the footman would throw open the door and mistress esmeralda would saunter up the little garden dragging yards of chiffon and lace in her train and acutely delightfully conscious of the heads peering from behind the curtains on either side of the road acknowledged beauty as she was her advent caused a greater sensation in this suburban district than among her own associates and though she affected to despise its demonstrations they were yet very dear to her vain little heart sometimes the two sisters were spirited away to lunch or a drive in the park and on their return would adjourn into number six and entertain miss munns and her niece with the story of their adventures there was a party every single day at park lane titled creatures and men who did things as pixie eloquently explained and miss munns recognized every name as it was repeated and inquired anxiously concerning clothes if the celebrity were of the female sex concerning manner and choice of eatables if he were a man once too before the date of the formal invitation sylvia herself was invited to accompany her friend to an afternoon reception when she beheld the fabled glories with her own eyes never before had she entered such a house 
or met so distinguished a company but not for worlds would she have allowed her surprise to be visible to esmeralda's eyes the fashionable expression she noticed was one of bored superiority so she looked bored and superior too refused offers of refreshments which she was really longing to accept and lounged from one room to another with an abstracted air as if unconscious of her surroundings all the same she felt very lonely and out of her depth for bridgie was helping her sister to receive her guests and pixie as usual roaming about in search of adventure it is very difficult to sit alone in a crowd and keep up an appearance of dignity and sylvia was grateful when a girl of her own age took possession of the chair by her side and began to talk without waiting for the formality of an introduction she was a pleasant-looking much freckled damsel with a wholesome out-of-door atmosphere which distinguished her from the other ladies present and she seemed for some reason quite interested in sylvia trevor all the time that they talked the honest blue eyes studied the little clear-cut face of her companion and though sylvia was puzzled to account for the scrutiny she was quite conscious of its presence and anxious that the decision should be in her favour she dropped her artificial airs and graces and talked simply and naturally asking questions about the different people present and listening to the biographical sketches which were given in return with much greater interest than was vouchsafed to her aunt's more humble reminiscences it was so interesting to meet a celebrated author in flesh and blood and find that she talked about the weather like any ordinary stupid person a statesman in whose hands lay the destiny of a nation yet could discuss with seriousness whether he should choose pink cakes or white so extraordinary to discover that this gorgeously attired lady was plain mrs somebody while the funny shabby-looking old woman in black was the celebrated duchess whose name was a household word sylvia understood now why esmeralda had been so anxious to place this guest in the most comfortable chair and had waited on her with such assiduous care she understood too why the duchess herself wore an expression of patient resignation and cast surreptitious glances at the clock poor creature these so-called amusements were the business of her life and one was so much like another that it was impossible to get up any feeling of interest much less amusement she yawned behind her glove and vouchsafed the briefest of answers to her companions it was abundantly evident in short that the duchess was bored and as this was the first time that she had honoured his house by a visit geoffrey was naturally anxious that this state of things should not continue esmeralda had done her utmost but her airs and graces had failed to make any impression on one who had been acquainted with the beauties of the last fifty years and there seemed no one present who possessed the requisite qualities to help him out of his difficulty the duchess was already acquainted with every visitor of note and would not care to be introduced to insignificant nonentities stay though what of the most insignificant of his guests what of pixie o'shaughnessy of the ready tongue and the audacious self-confidence which would flourish unchecked in the presence of kings and emperors pixie forever pixie to the rescue cried geoffrey to himself and promptly stole across the room set apart for refreshments where his small sister-in-law sat eating her fourth ice and waited upon with assiduous care by her friend montgomery pixie he said there's an old lady in black sitting under the big palm in the yellow drawing-room and looking dreadfully bored just go and talk to her like a good girl and see if you can amuse her a bit before she goes i will so responded pixie heartily it's a very dull party when there's nothing to do but be pleasant i was bored myself before i began to eat i'll leave the ice now but maybe i'll venture on another by and by in black you said under the palm 
she flicked a lapful of crumbs on to the floor and pranced away with her light dancing step geoffrey watched her from the doorway saw her squeeze herself into the corner of the lounge on which the duchess was seated and gaze into her face with the broadest of broad beaming smiles while the great lady in her turn put up a lorgnon and stared back in amazed curiosity well little girl said the duchess smiling and what have you got to say plenty thank you i always have me difficulty is to find some one to listen replied miss pixie with a confidential nod the old lady looked extraordinarily thin the lines on her face crossed and recrossed like the most intricate puzzle her lips were sunken and the tips of nose and chin were at perilously close quarters but her eyes were young still such sharp bright little eyes and they twinkled just as pat's did when he was pleased talk to me then i'll stop you when i'm bored she said and at that pixie nodded once again of course we always do jack stamps on me foot and pat snores the same as if he were asleep he says he is strong enough to hear a tale six times over but he won't listen to it a seventh to please man nor woman bridgie says jokes are one of the trials of family life because by the time you've improved the points so that no one would recognize them for the same your relations won't give you a hearing it's a curious thing when you think of it that you get so exhausted with other people's stories while you go on laughing at your own bridgie says you'll find fifty people to cry with you for one who will sympathize about jokes have you found it that way in your experience upon my word cried the duchess with unction this bridgie appears to be a remarkably sensible young woman my experience has been that i rarely meet a joke that is not my own exclusive property to judge by the faces of my companions do you happen to possess a name my youthful philosopher i should like to know to whom i am talking i'm pixie o'shaughnessy and geoffrey married my sister esmeralda he came over to ireland and fell in love with her in spite of me telling him about her bad temper thinking of course that he was a perfect stranger i apologized to him after it was settled and said there was nothing really wrong with her for she'd always rather be pleasant than not only at times it's easier to be nasty and she's been lazy from her youth the night they met they mistook each other for ghosts and esmeralda clung to his arm and screeched for help there was never a thing that girl was frightened at all her life until now and would you believe it it's her own servants of course in ireland they were like friends as free and easy as we were ourselves and entering into the conversation at table but geoffrey's englishmen are so solemn and proper that she lives in terror of shocking their feelings one day the butler found her kissing geoffrey believing they were alone and she waited for him to say allow me madam as he always does if she ventures to do a hand's turn for herself she says it's dispiriting to think you can't even quarrel in peace for fear of interruption and it takes a good deal to interrupt esmeralda when once she started the duchess screwed up her bright little eyes and her shoulders shook beneath her black lace cape sylvia and her companion watching the strangely assorted pair from across the room saw pixie move nearer and nearer and whisper a long dramatic history saw the duchess nod her head in appreciation of the various points and heard the burst of laughter which greeted the denouement every one stopped talking and stared with inquiring eyes esmeralda turned towards the lounge anxiety thinly disguised by smiles and seeing her the duchess rose from her seat with a sigh of regret your sister is a born story-teller mrs hilliard i wish i had more time to listen please ask me to meet her again it is a long time since i have been so amused here was praise indeed esmeralda beamed with satisfaction and seized pixie's hand 
with an unusual outburst of affection how noble of you dear she was looking as bored as bored and i was at my wit's end what did you tell her that made her laugh like that oh nothing much just things about ourselves and the adventures at home twas the beeswax pudding that pleased her most said pixie easily and wondered at esmeralda's sudden extinction of interest now what disclosures has that child been making next cried the freckled girl looking on at this little scene with curious eyes i doubt whether esmeralda appreciates them as much as the duchess we used to say at home that if there was one thing which should not be revealed pixie was bound to choose it as the subject of conversation on the first possible occasion and she was so sweet and innocent about it too that it was impossible to be angry i expect you have found that out for yourself yes no said sylvia absently for she was thinking less of what she was saying than of certain phrases which her companion had just uttered we used to say at home who, who was this then who had known pixie o'shaughnessy in bygone days could it by any chance be the dreaded rival towards whom she was prepared to cherish so ardent a dislike she stared at the honest kindly face and felt that it would be difficult to harbour a prejudice against its owner even if if are you miss burrell she asked and molly smiled assent i am that and you are sylvia trevor i've heard about you from bridgie yes we've been great friends all winter not bridgie no we had so much to discuss about the old place and its people that i'm afraid we never mentioned your name it was not bridgie oh said sylvia and stared across the room it might of course have been esmeralda herself who had enlightened miss burrell's ignorance but there was a mysterious something in the girl's manner which gave a different impression she was too proud to ask questions and miss burrell volunteered no information but smiled to herself as at an interesting reminiscence it seemed as though what she had heard had been of a distinctly pleasant character sylvia returned home feeling mysteriously happy and elated and the sight of a letter addressed to herself in her father's handwriting put the finishing touch on her satisfaction she took it upstairs to her own room and sat herself down on the one comfortable chair which she possessed to read its contents with undisturbed enjoyment she was in no hurry to break the seal however for it was so pleasant just to hold the letter in her hand and lean back comfortably against the cushions and dream the dreams it is true were mostly concerned with the events of the afternoon and molly burrell's intent and kindly scrutiny but it was like the old times when she had thought her own thoughts with her hand clasped in that of the dear old dad and the touch of the sheet on which his fingers had rested brought back the old feeling of strength and security she had told him much about her new friends and he seemed always to wish to hear more asking carefully veiled questions the meaning of which were perfectly understood by his shrewd little daughter dad was anxious about this friendship with the family which included a handsome grown-up son among its members a trifle afraid lest she should be spirited away to another home before he had enjoyed his own innings poor old darling murmured sylvia remorsefully for at the bottom of her heart she knew well which home she would choose if the choice were given and it did seem hard horribly hard that a parent should love and guard and work for his child from the hour of her birth and that when she had grown old and sensible enough to be a companion instead of a care she should immediately desert him for another but i could never love dad any less never never i'd give anything in the world to see him again sylvia cried mentally as she opened the envelope and straightened the thin foreign sheets it was a long letter and took a long time to read and in the process sylvia's expression changed once and again and finally settled into one of incredulous dismay 
it was not that the news was bad on the contrary it was good very good indeed the thing above all others which she would have wished to hear but it threatened a complete uprooting of her life just as it was growing most interesting and full of possibilities dad was coming home was even now on his way and had desired her to meet him on his arrival at marseilles it was incredible quite incredible in its startling unexpectedness she turned again to the wonderful paragraph and read it over once more slowly and carefully and now my darling i have a piece of news which i hope and believe will be welcome to you certain business changes have taken place of late which you would not understand even if i tried to explain them but such as they are they set me free to return home at my own convenience i have been impatiently waiting this settlement of affairs for some time back as i have been most anxious to see you after your long illness and to satisfy myself that the best means are being used to restore the full use of your foot i have made inquiries here and believe that a course of baths of the german spa b would probably put the final touch to what has already been done i propose therefore that you engage in good time a trustworthy lady courier from an office in london and travel in her company to marseilles where i will meet you in the first week of june having previously spent a week or ten days in italy with my old friends the nisbets who return in the same boat come prepared for a summer abroad and we can fit you up with any extras that are needed before we start on our travels after you have finished your course of treatment and are i trust thoroughly convalescent we will have a tour through switzerland and settle down at some mountain hotel where the air will brace us up after our sufferings climatic and otherwise for the future i have as yet no definite plans except that of course you will not return to your present quarters perhaps we may eventually find a house that suits us in the south of england but i can't face english winters after my long residence in this sunny land and you must make up your mind to humour a restless old anglo-indian for the next few years to come by that time i may have regained my old strength and nerve which have sadly failed of late i will wire from brindisi as to definite arrangements sylvia let the letter drop on her lap and stared before her with blank eyes through the curtains could be seen a glimpse of the house opposite the blind at bridgie's window drawn up at its usual rakish angle in three weeks in less than three weeks she would say good-bye forever to rutland road and its inhabitants good-bye to england itself it appeared for at least a year to come and at two-and-twenty a year is as long as a lifetime if it divides us from those we love she would drift away out of sight and the last six months would become but an episode in her own life and those of her friends do you remember sylvia the girl with the bark on the road in imagination she could hear pixie putting the question in the years to come and bridgie would remember quite well because she had not the faculty of forgetting but other people other people were reputedly fickle and tempted to forget old friends in favour of new other people would probably be in love with a fair-haired beauty by that time and have forgotten all about sylvia trevor the pain which shot through the girl's heart at these reflections was so sharp that it startled her into a realization of her own position dad was coming home she was going to live with him once more and instead of being elated and happy she was miserable miserable she was going to leave her aunt's home with the restrictions and lack of sympathy which had made it so trying and was once more to live with the fondest and most indulgent of parents and instead of filling her with delight the news seemed like a sentence of banishment from all that made life worth living to do sylvia justice she was shocked at her own thoughts and made a valiant effort to look at the prospect in a more dutiful spirit at least she determined 
no one should suspect a want of loyalty to that best and kindest of men aunt margaret would take for granted that she felt nothing but delight and she would postpone breaking the news to bridgie until she had grown accustomed to the idea of separation and could discuss it with composure it would be easier than usual to keep this resolve for since esmeralda's arrival the neighbours necessarily saw less of each other than in the long winter days when there had been no rival claims on their time and attention aunt margaret would be pleased to find that she was chosen as counsellor and adviser-in-chief and during the short time which was left she must do her utmost to gratify the old lady who had been on the whole very kind and forbearing during the two years they had spent together i wish i had been nicer to her sighed sylvia regretfully i was always meaning to be but now it's too late that's the worst of putting off things in this world the chance may never come again End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of more about pixie by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain great expectations a whole week passed by before sylvia had an opportunity of telling her great news to her friend to begin with bridgie was absent from home for three days and nights attending a ball and a water party given by esmeralda for the entertainment of her house party and to neither of which sylvia had received an invitation to be sure it was no use going to a dance when dancing was an impossibility and the getting in and out of boats would have been painful and difficult but all the same sylvia felt slighted and out in the cold and though absent in the flesh mentally followed every stage in the two entertainments and tortured herself by imagining jack's light-hearted enjoyment and absorption in other company than her own when bridgie returned home miss munns insisted on several expeditions to town and also to surrounding suburbs where lived those family connections to whom it was clearly the girl's duty to say good-bye the old lady was quite inclined to enjoy the little stir of preparation involved by the trip abroad and would allow no one but herself to interview the lady in whose charge her niece was to travel that she was entirely satisfied was the best possible guarantee for sylvia's safety and mistress courier rickman promised to be ready to start the moment the expected wire was received miss munns laid in a store of patent medicines stocked her niece's workbox with every imaginable useful and waxed quite affectionate in her manner but all the same it was easy to see that she would be relieved to get rid of her charge and settle down once more in the old groove it requires a great deal of forbearance and unselfish imagination to enable a young person and an old to live together happily and the lack of these qualities is the explanation of many miserable homes old people should remember that the peaceful monotony which has become their own idea of happiness must by the laws of nature spell a very different word to buoyant restless youth and also that there comes a stage when the children are not children any longer when they are entitled to their own opinions and may even most reverently be it said understand what is best for themselves better than those of a different generation and the young people in their turn should remember the long years of tender care and devotion which they have received and be infinitely patient in their turn they who are so impatient of passing ailments should try to imagine how it would feel to be always feeble and to see in the future the certainty of growing more and more suffering and incapable they should realize that it is in their power to make the sunshine of declining days and thereby to store up for themselves a lasting joy instead of a reproach in looking back upon those two years spent in rutland road sylvia forgot her aunt's lack of sympathy her prosy talk and repeated fault-finding 
they were lost in remembering the true kindness of heart which lay beneath all mannerism what she was never able to forget was her own impatience and neglect of opportunity once or twice as the days passed by bridgie o'shaughnessy ran to the gate to intercept her friend as she passed and exchange a hurried greeting but sylvia would not trust her great news to such occasions as these she waited until an opportunity arose for an uninterrupted talk and as she waited a desire awoke and grew in intensity to herself tell jack of the coming separation bridgie must of course be informed of the journey to france and germany but she would wait until the evening of esmeralda's reception before disclosing the full extent of her travels when she and jack were sitting together in one of the charming little niches in which the rooms abounded he would naturally begin to talk of her journey and she would smile and look unconcerned and in the most cheerful and natural of tones announce that she was not coming back to rutland road that it would probably be a year at least before she saw england again surely when he heard this for the first time when it was burst upon him as an utter surprise she would read in his face whether she had been right in imagining that he really cared or if it had been a delusion born of girlish vanity she would be quite calm and serene would not in any way pose as a martyr or seem to expect any expression of distress but she could not could not bring herself to go away without making this one innocent little effort to solve the mystery which meant so much to her happiness and peace of mind so sylvia purposely kept out of bridgie's way during the ten days after the receipt of her letter and when they met it was easy to tell just what she chose and keep silent about the rest for bridgie was not one of the curious among womenkind and never dreamt of questioning and cross-questioning as to the plans of another she simply took for granted that sylvia would return to her old quarters after a pleasant summer holiday just as she was happily assured that her friend felt nothing but purest joy and satisfaction in the prospect before her oh me darling she cried rapturously i am delighted for you isn't that the very best news that could happen so soon too and a lovely jaunt together in the beautiful summer weather twill make you strong again in no time and you will write me long letters telling me all your adventures and twill be almost as good as having them myself i couldn't tell you when i've been so pleased hm, said sylvia disconsolately would jack be delighted also and hail her departure with rapturous congratulations won't you miss me won't you feel lonely when i'm not here she questioned earnestly and bridgie smiled a cheery reassurement i'll have esmeralda you see she will be here until the end of the season and then we are going up to scotland with her we shall be so busy and taken up with one thing and another that i shan't have time to miss you darling huh said sylvia once more this was intended for comfort she was aware but it was not the kind of comfort that was required bridgie o'shaughnessy might be so unselfish as to rejoice because a friend did not suffer by her absence but sylvia longed to hear that she was indispensable and that nothing and no one could fill her place it was another bitter drop in her cup to realize that the o'shaughnessy girls were so closely united that any friend must needs be at a discount in comparison with a sister you don't seem as excited as i should have expected is there anything worrying you dear bridgie inquired and sylvia hurriedly searched for a plausible excuse and found it in her father's health in reality she was not disquieted by his reference to his own weakness for he had been complaining for months back without apparently growing worse and she was convinced that the coming rest would speedily restore him to health it made an excuse however and bridgie sympathized and offered a dozen kindly unpractical suggestions as her custom was then the conversation drifted to the all-important reception which was so close at hand and to which both girls were looking forward with such expectation 
bridgie related the latest arrangements for the entertainment of some three hundred guests while her friend listened with eager attention esmeralda was sparing neither money nor pains to make the evening one of the events of the season singers and musicians whose names were known throughout europe were to perform at intervals in the great drawing-room the hall and staircase were to be transformed into a bower of roses pink la france roses here there and everywhere wreathed around the banisters massed on the window-sills and mantelpieces hanging in great golden baskets from the ceiling rose-coloured shades were to soften the glare of the electric lights the air was to be kept cool by great blocks of ice and scented fountains rising from banks of moss and ferns the conservatory was to be illuminated by jewelled lanterns it sounded like a fairy tale to the girl in the unfashionable suburb and she would have been less than human if she had not counted the hours which must elapse before the evening arrived bridgie thought it a pity that the guests could not be labelled for the edification of the unsophisticated but sylvia's greatest interest was centred on figures which were too familiar to be mistaken the whole entertainment was in truth but a gorgeous setting to that conversation with jack which might be their last tete-a-tete for so long to come the dressmaker who was preparing miss trevor's dress for the great occasion had seldom had more difficulty in satisfying an employer and the sum total expended on fineries would have horrified miss munns if she had been allowed to see the bills even sylvia winced when she added up the figures but she repeated sturdily the old phrase dad won't mind and felt secure that she would meet with no worse reprimand than a little good-natured banter on the whole she had been very economical during her stay in england and her conscience did not upbraid her concerning this one extravagance End of chapter 22chapter twenty three of more about pixie by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain a telegram as soon as her room was in order on the day of the reception sylvia began the delightful task of opening boxes and parcels and laying their contents on the bed the satin skirt was spread out with careful fingers and over it a foam of frills and flounces which must surely have grown since it was inconceivable that they could have been fashioned by mortal hands fan and gloves and little lacy handkerchief lay side by side on the pillows little satin shoes stood at a jaunty angle the crystal buckles shining in the sun the pearl necklace which had been a present from dad on her twenty-first birthday lay on the toilet table ready to be snapped on and a spray of white roses and maiden hair floated in a basin of water all was ready and sylvia beamed with delight at the result of her preparations she had come upstairs ostensibly to rest but in reality she was far too excited to settle down even to read and could only wander about the room inventing one little duty after another and weaving endless day-dreams in a corner of the room stood her travelling-box a convenient receptacle into which to put the new purchases as they arrived from the shops the travelling dress the piles of cool garments for summer wear lay neatly packed away looking fresh and dainty enough to have charmed any girl's heart but this afternoon sylvia had no thought for the future every hope and ambition was centred on the events of the next few hours three o'clock how slowly the time passed four five six seven eight nine six hours still to while away before she would drive from the door with pixie by her side and jack vis-a-vis -vis, leaning forward to look her over and exclaim in admiration at her fine feathers sylvia could almost imagine that she heard him speak and saw the sudden softening of the handsome eyes and for once in her life she was inclined to rejoice that bridgie was again staying at park lane 
since pixie and pat would be so much engrossed in their own discussions as to ensure a virtual tete-a-tete for their companions she rose restlessly from her seat and walked to the window was pixie occupied even as she had been herself in laying out her dress for the evening she peered curiously through the opposite windows but no sign of the inhabitants was to be seen she yawned drummed her fingers against the pane and stared idly down the road it was not a lively neighbourhood at the best of times and to-day it seemed even duller than usual a nurse was wheeling a perambulator along the pavement a milkman's cart was making slow progress from door to door a telegraph boy was sauntering down the middle of the road whistling a popular air sylvia wondered where he was going and what was the nature of the message which she bore some people were so nervous about telegrams aunt margaret for instance it was so rarely that her quiet life was disturbed by a message of sufficient importance to make it worth while for the sender to expend sixpence on its delivery sylvia's heart gave a leap of apprehension as the thought arose that perhaps the message was for the o'shaughnessy household to tell of some dire accident which had interfered with the festivity of the evening she had hardly time to breathe a sigh of relief as the boy passed the gate of number three before apprehension reawoke as he approached her own doorway a telegram for aunt margaret what could it be ought she to go downstairs to lend the support of her presence or stay in her room where she was supposed to be enjoying a refreshing nap she heard the opening of the door and the sound of voices in the hall then to her surprise footsteps ascended the stairs and some one whispered a gentle summons sylvia are you awake a telegram has arrived for you my dear you had better see it at once miss munns looked flurried and anxious but her niece smiled a placid reassurement i expect it is from father fixing the date of my journey he said he would wire she tore open the envelope and glanced hurriedly at the address yes it is he is at marseilles come at her voice died away and she stood staring at the words in horrified incredulity while miss munns stepped forward hurriedly and peered over her shoulder come at once father dangerously ill remain in charge till you come nisbet 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 that was the name of the friends with whom he was to travel dangerously ill at once what can it mean sylvia laid the paper on the bed and pressed her hands against her head she was deathly pale but perfectly composed and quiet and the expression of her eyes showed that so far from being stunned she was thinking in quick capable fashion there is a train from charing cross at four o'clock she said presently i should arrive in paris at midnight and at marseilles some time to-morrow it is three now my box is more than half packed i shall have time mary must go out and order a cab my dear it is impossible you cannot possibly leave to-day i will go with you myself and i cannot get ready in an hour's notice wait until to-morrow and sylvia turned round with a flash of anger in her eyes but suddenly softened and took both the old lady's hands in her own holding them in a tender pressure listen she said and her voice gentle though it was had in it a new quality which awed and impressed the hearer listen there is not one single minute to spare if there was a train at half-past three i should catch that box or no box for father is dying aunt margaret he would not have let me be summoned like this for any passing ailment nothing in all the world would make me wait here until to-morrow so please dear do not hinder me now i know it is impossible for you to come with me but i will telegraph the moment i arrive and if-if there is still time you can follow then but you can't travel alone 
edward would not like it he is so particular how can you manage about the trains listen i have thought of that too put on your bonnet and go to the telephone office at the corner ask the people at the agency if they can possibly send a lady courier to meet me at the train at charing cross if they can very well if they can't i am twenty-two i can speak french easily and am not afraid of travelling by myself i will telegraph to cook's agent to meet me in paris if it will make you any happier but i am going auntie dear and i have not a moment to spare i will get dressed now and the cab must be here in half an hour miss munns turned without a word and left the room she had the sense to know when she was beaten and having once faced the situation set to work in her usual business-like fashion and proved the most capable of helpers having been successful in arranging for a lady courier through the convenient medium of the telephone she returned home to write labels fasten together cloaks and umbrellas and order a hasty but tempting little meal for the refreshment of the traveller this accomplished she returned once more to the bedroom where sylvia was putting the last touches to her packing nearly finished that's right my dear you have eight minutes still and tea is waiting for you downstairs don't trouble to tidy the room i'll attend to that after you have gone all these things on the bed they had better be packed away in the attics i suppose it's a pity they were ever bought as things have turned out you may never need them now no i may never need them now said sylvia steadily in one minute aunt just one minute you go down and pour out my tea and i'll follow immediately i've just one thing more i want to do don't dawdle then don't dawdle mary will fasten the straps don't wait for that miss munns departed unwillingly enough and sylvia shut the door after her and gave a swift step back towards the bed the satin dress and the fan and the gloves and the jaunty little shoes lay there looking precisely the same as they had done an hour ago the only difference was in the eyes which beheld them sylvia had read of a bride it was buried in her wedding dress and she felt at this moment as if she were leaving her own girlhood behind with that mass of dainty white finery what lay in the future she could not tell only one thing seemed certain that those few words on the slip of brown paper had made a great chasm of separation between it and the past the opportunity for which she had longed was not to be hers she must leave england without so much as a word of farewell to the friends who of late had filled such a large part of her life if her plans had been frustrated by one of the annoying little contretemps of daily life sylvia would have exhausted herself in lamentations and repinings but she was dumb before this great catastrophe which came so obviously from a higher hand when her father lay dying there was no regret in her heart for a lost amusement but this hurried departure might mean more much more than the forfeiture of esmeralda's hospitality she stretched out her hand and smoothed the satin folds with a very tender touch good-bye she whispered softly in the silence of the room good-bye jack End of chapter 23